So let's continue the story of equilibrium conversion in an adiabatic reactor. However, now we're going to use our knowledge to make some money. It's consultation time. Tamam? So it should be associated in, my, in our mind that more knowledge can bring more money. Tamam? So it shouldn't be in our mind that luck brings money. Tamam? And this is what's known as the knowledge-based economy and this is something which our leaders Allah Fadam, been talking about in the past decade that this region should now start making money not because we have oil but because we also have knowledge that's why we have this vast quantity of a vast number of universities that have been established and they are all striving to become the best universities around the world Okay, so we're going to use our knowledge now to offer consultation to companies and in return, we're going to get some money. So let's see, assuming that the reaction kinetics is very fast. So this reaction, A goes to B, is very fast reaction. The rate of reaction is fast. Okay, it just occurs readily. The question now is, how can the maximum achievable conversion x e be increased how can we increase so now the maximum achievable conversion for this reaction at this specified at these specified conditions is only 42 percent and we are not happy with this so a company approaches me and say well uh, we have this reaction where we are producing b from a and all what we are getting is 42 percent conversion we tried, we, we got better catalyst, we changed the catalyst to a newer catalyst, you know, and no use. We are always getting maximum 42%. We cannot go beyond this. Can you please help us? We say, yeah, we can do this. We can study for you and offer you some information and do this consultation for you. In return, we get some good amount of money. Okay, so... How can we do this? Any idea, Shabab? Well, first, we can push this conversion forward. Tamam. Push this reaction forward by and obtain higher conversion by different means. The first method is by changing the reactor type or operation mode. For example, use reactive distillation. Yani if B was very volatile, tamam, we can use reactive distillation. So we can heat up the reaction mixture and then B evaporates. So we have lower concentration of B in the reaction mixture and then the reaction will be shifted. The equilibrium will be shifted forward. Okay. And or we can use, for example, membrane reactor if B diffuses out. Okay, that's uh, one way. Okay, and see, Shabab, all, all the methods that we're going to suggest is related to thermodynamics because I know this, the reaction is limited thermodynamically. The conversion is limited thermodynamically. Okay, the reaction goes very fast, in fact. So it's not limited kinetically. What's the other option? Adding heat exchanger to the reactor. Okay, in this case, we want to cool the reactor correct because the reaction is exothermic so, and if you cool the reactor cool the reaction mixture you will shift the equilibrium forward as well okay third solution changing the feed temperature in this case we can lower the feed temperature because if we lower the feed temperature that means we'll have lower temperature inside the reactor. Lower operating temperature means we have higher equilibrium conversion. Okay, so we are limited by equilibrium conversion. The conversion is limited by, the, by thermodynamics. So the maximum achievable conversion, we say it can be 
increased by changing the reactor type or operating mode. Okay, so what if other reactor types are not suitable? What are other operation modes are not suitable? For instance, what if A and B have same boiling point? What if we they have same almost sizes? Okay, so we cannot use membrane either. Okay, no reactor distillation, no membrane reactor will be helpful. Okay, so let's explore the second option, adding heat exchanger to the reactor. Okay, but reactions in industry are frequently carried out adiabatically. You know, it's uh, very common to run the reactions in adiabatic reactors and not worry about heat exchange in the reactor. But usually we use heat exchangers up, upstream or downstream. So the reactors are often operated adiabatically. So what do you suggest to do? Therefore, we can employ what is known as reactor staging with interstage cooling or interstage heating. How does that work? Well, let's look at this. So instead of having one long plug flow reactor or packed bed reactor, we're going to stage it. Stage one. Okay, stage one. This is stage one, and then stage two, and then stage three. Okay, so again, instead of having one long reactor, now we're gonna chop it off into pieces, into stages. And between, between each two stages, we'll have a heat exchanger. Come on, that's why it's called enter. Enter stage. Enter stage means between, right? Between stages, like international, between nations, like internet, right? So connection between different servers and computers and so on. So in between, so in between these stages, we have coolers or heaters, heat exchangers. So the flow passes, you know, through the first reactor and then goes so it passes through the first reactor and then goes through a heat exchanger in this case because our reaction is exothermic we need to cool it so we cool it down from 800 to 500 then again it enters the second stage with the same initial temperature here same on and then as the reaction progresses the temperature increases because the reactor is operated adiabatically and the reaction is exothermic so it gets out with a higher temperature and then again another interstage cooler same on drop uh, reducing temperature to 500 degrees C again, and then you have the third stage. Okay, so now, Shabab, my question is okay, uh, how would the XE versus T curve would look like? So, would the XE, which is function of KC, which is KC's function of temperature, curve change for the shown setup? Well, obviously not. So well, it does not really, it does not really change. Okay, but let's see what changes. Okay, so we are in the beginning here, in the first stage. So we are here, zero conversion. And as the reaction progresses down the length of the reactor, what happens to the temperature? The temperature increases, right? Temperature increases as the reaction progresses, means as the conversion increases. Okay, and right before, right before I reach the adiabatic equilibrium conversion, so mom, I stop here the reactor, okay, and take the reaction mixture through a cooler. So I cool it down to 500 degrees C again. See? And as you can see, when I'm cooling, Shabab, I'm not affecting the conversion. I'm maintaining the same conversion. Therefore, I go back horizontally. I go back horizontally. Okay? Temperature is decreasing all the way to 500 degrees C again. And now, you introduce it to the second stage where you have the conversion starts here. And then the conversion increases and at the same time the temperature increases as well and right before i reach the 
adiabatic equilibrium conversion, right? Before I hit the equilibrium line, equilibrium conversion line, again, I take, I stop the reactor here, zoom up, and take the reaction mixture through a heat exchanger to where we cool it down again to 500 degree C. Come on. And here we go, 500 degree C. And then now I introduce it to the third stage where again the conversion increases. So we have catalyst here. Come on. The conversion increases and the temperature increases as well. Okay, so what's the benefit of this? Let's see what the benefit of this is. Okay, if we had used, if we had used only one reactor, okay, one reactor, then the maximum achievable conversion would be the adiabatic equilibrium conversion. Right, the adiabatic equilibrium conversion, which could be around 0.4. But now with this setup, with interstage cooling, now my maximum achievable conversion was extended from 42% all the way to, I don't know, let's say maybe 92%. Okay, so with this, I have crossed the barrier of the thermodynamic, which applied to only a single reactor. So now I increase the limit. Okay, good. So interstage cooling has helped me. Still, I'm operating the reactors adiabatically. Still. The, I'm operating the reactors adiabatically. One would say, okay, how can I guarantee that I can really stop right before I reach equilibrium? Well, you design, you design the reactor. So when I come to the first stage, I design it. I means I will calculate its required volume that will enable me to achieve a conversion of, for example, 38 percent. Come on. So I design it this way. Okay. One would say, okay, why 38 percent? Why not 40 percent? If the maximum achievable conversion is 42 percent, why don't I go up to 42 percent? Well, the issue is to move from here, from 38 percent to 42 percent, you will require huge amount of catalyst you require a large reactor because when i'm at 38 percent conversion trying to go to 42 percent conversion approaching equilibrium the rate of reaction here is very slow because i'm very close to equilibrium and if the rate of reaction is very slow that means you require large reactor in order to just increase the conversion by these four points Okay, good. Let's look at endothermic reaction. Okay, and this is how Xe looks for an endothermic reaction. As you increase the temperature, as you increase the temperature, the equilibrium conversion increases, right? Because it's an endothermic reaction. I'm supplying more heat. I'm increasing the temperature so that equilibrium is shifted forward. Okay, so what do we need in this? case if it's an endothermic reaction well if it's an endothermic reaction you know that when you operate the reactor adiabatically as the reaction progresses yani as the conversion increases the temperature drops so the temperature decreases right so that decreases the equilibrium conversion so i need to add interstage heating so i heat up and then another stage and then heat up again and produce it to another stage. So this is known as interstage heating. So let's look at this. Let's look at this case where we have interstage or reactors and stages with interstage coolers. 
Tamam. So we have energy balance. Talk about energy balance for reactors and series. I want to write an energy balance for reactors and series where we don't have side stream, no side streams. That means I can use the suggested definition of conversion, which is based on the feed to the first reactor. So if I say X2, that means that's the conversion achieved at point. That's the conversion achieved up to point two compared to the feed to the first reactor. Tamam? Okay, so energy balance for a single reactor or the first reactor in series is written this way, right? You know, accumulation equals input minus output through heat, through work, through mass, through energy, through energy associated to mass, which is enthalpy basically if we neglect the kinetic energy and the potential energy of the stream in and out. Okay, and we have a steady state, so this guy goes to zero, so I write delta H equals Q dot minus shaft work. Okay, so for a, this is for a single uh, reactor, okay, and we wrote it this way. We wrote the delta H. This way we said we will first heat the feed, see the feed, theta, we first heat the feed from T naught to T, okay, and then we run the reaction at, at T. Okay, so this is the energy balance. Okay, come on, very good, very good. Okay, what I'm gonna do now, what I'm gonna do now is multiply, this guy will take it inside. If you take this guy inside multiplied by theta. You know the definition of theta, right? So theta i is simply f i naught over f a naught. Correct? So if I multiply f a naught into theta i, so we have here f a naught, come on, then you, this guy cancels. Oops. This guy cancels out with this guy, and you remain with if I not so here we go that's the if I not that's the if I not which we have in, when we multiply if a not to into theta I okay so this is how we wrote the energy balance for the single reactor or the first reactor now what would be modified in the above equation for the second reactor for the second reactor well for the second reactor okay let's look at the second reactor here Tamam. and before we proceed let's decide on the symbols on numbering the stream okay so let's look at r1 let's look at r1 for r1 for r1 the feed is labeled as zero Tamam. that's the feed and the stream leaving reactor one is labeled as one Therefore, you have here X1, T1, and so on. So on. Then this feed goes into an interstage cooler. And later on, it will go to reactor 2. If this is reactor 2, the feed is labeled as 0, 2. So on. It's a feed to reactor 2, so it's 0, 2. And you guessed it. The stream leaving reactor 2 is labeled as 2. And again, it goes through a third reactor and then... Uh, sorry, second heat exchanger and then proceeds to a third reactor where the stream fed to the third reactor is 0, 3 and then the stream leaving is stream 3 and so on. So, so now that we know all the labeling for the streams for the reactors, for the heat exchangers, and so on. Now that we wrote the first equation, or the energy balance equation for the first reactor, let's now, before we go and write the energy balance for the second reactor, let's now actually modify this equation to write it for an nth reactor. Okay, so let's look at all each term and decide what would be changed. So we're talking about 
here and this term here we're talking about the feed to the reactor right so i'm doing balance on the reactor so this represents the delta h the difference in enthalpy of the stream leaving the reactor compared to the stream entering the reactor so the feed to the reactor tamam will not be if i not it will be if i not n tamam and the temperature of the stream leaving will be t n but the temperature of the stream entering will be t 0 n right for example t 0 2 for example okay tamam okay good good and what about what about this term what about this term well basically this term tells you about the heat released the heat released or absorbed of course if it was endothermic so let's talk to the here this case where you have exothermic reaction let's talk about the heat released in that reactor okay that happens with association to the amount of air reacted right so i cannot really here come here and put xn so here i cannot just take it to this right because if a naught if a naught times xn will give you the total moles of a reacted up to the exit of reactor 2 but this is not true this does not represent how much heat released into reactor 2 only this gives you the total heat released okay so that means i'll need to do the following i need to subtract from it the x n minus 1 so subtract so i have if i have x n is up to here this is x n up to here i have to subtract from it whatever conversion up to this point so if you subtract then you have this conversion which happened here moles of a reacted up happens in reactor 2 only in reactor n only so multiply by delta h reaction at the exit of that reactor this will give me how much heat released into that reactor and then you have q dot n and then the shaft work n as well come on however shabab sometimes i want to study what's going on inside the reactor i want to study what's going on down the length of the reactor okay so that means that means that this tn is not the temperature at the exit this is the a variable temperature okay and this x now is not the x here but it's a variable x down the length of the reactor and then i can simply also write q dot which will be understood that it's up to that point into the reactor the same thing with the shaft work okay so i hope now this equation is clear so this is how you can see it neatly okay now let's write now the energy balance for the second reactor so let's look at the equation so let's look at this equation and let's write the energy balance for the second reactor so what do we have we have summation of if i for all the different species that are on stream 0 2 okay so we are concerned with the feed here that's entering tamam okay let's continue multiply by cp i in that stream multiply by t temperature inside the reactor temperature inside the reactor at any location minus the 
feed temperature to that reactor. What's the feed temperature to that reactor? Well, it is T02, correct? It's T02. Then plus FA0. Okay, maybe I should write the plus here. Plus FA0 times X, the conversion down the length of this reactor, minus the conversion in the previous reactor. So the conversion uh, at the exit of the previous reactor is X1, right? And you can see it here because our N, our N is 2, correct? Our N is 2, see? So 2 minus 1 will be 1. So here, we have here 1. We have here 1. Okay, and again, because I don't have side streams, this con these conversions, these conversions are based on FA0. That's why I have FA0 here. Type, multiply by, multiply by delta H reaction, which is function of T inside the second reactor equals Q dot minus shaft work. Okay, so now we learned how to write energy balance around any reactor or any stage of the reactor. Tamam? And of course, we can combine it with the material balance, the design equation that we can write for every reactor. You want an example? I can give you an example now, no problem. So if this reactor, again, if this reactor, reactor 2, was a CSTR, so the design equation would be V2 equals FA0 divided by minus RA2 multiply by X2 minus X1, right? Okay, good. What if this reactor was plug flow reactor? Hmm, simple. V2 for a plug flow reactor is integration of again FA0 over minus RA dx evaluated from x1 to x2. Okay, again, you can see that we have here FA0, we have here FA0, that is because all the x's, all the x's are based on the feed to the first reactor since we have reactors in series with no side strings. طيب. With this, we conclude this lecture and in the following lecture, we try to use what we have learned. Bye for now.